Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so dies. Much better. Isn't that so? You've tried to get into the, the vampire. It happened that in the midst of the dissipations attendant upon a London winter, there appeared at the various parties of the leaders of the ton a nobleman more remarkable for his singularities than his rank. He gazed upon the mirth around him as if he could not participate therein. Apparently the light laughter of the fair only attracted his attention that he might by a look quell it and throw fear into those breasts where thoughtlessness reigned. Those who felt this sensation of awe could not explain whence it arose. Some attributed it to the dead grey eye which, fixing upon the object's face, did not seem to penetrate, and at one glance to pierce through to the inward workings of the heart, but fell upon the cheek, with a leaden ray that weighed upon the skin it could not pass. His peculiarities caused him to be invited to every house. All wished to see him, and those who had been accustomed to violent excitement, and now felt the weight of ennui, were pleased at having something in their presence capable of engaging their attention. In spite of the deadly hue of his face, which never gained a warmer tint, either from the blush of modesty or from the strong emotion of passion, though its form and outline were beautiful, many of the female hunters after notoriety attempted to win his attentions and gain at least some marks of what they might term affection. Lady Mercer, who had been the mockery of every monster shown in drawing-rooms since her marriage, threw herself in his way and did all but put on the dress of a mountebank to attract his notice, though in vain. When she stood before him, though his eyes were apparently fixed upon hers, still it seemed as if they were unperceived. Even her unappalled impudence was baffled, and she left the field. But though the common adulteress could not influence even the guidance of his eyes, it was not that the female sex was indifferent to him. Yet such was the apparent caution with which he spoke to the virtuous wife and innocent daughter that few knew he ever addressed himself to females. He had, however, the reputation of a winning tongue, and whether it was that it even overcame the dread of his singular character, or that they were moved by his apparent hatred of vice, he was as often among those females who form the boast of their sex from their domestic virtues as among those who sully it by their vices. About the same time there came to London a young gentleman of the name of Aubrey. He was an orphan left with an only sister in the possession of great wealth by parents who died while he was yet in childhood left also to himself by guardians, who thought it their duty merely to take care of his fortune, while they relinquished the more important charge of his mind to the care of mercenary subalterns, he cultivated more his imagination than his judgment. He had hence that high romantic feeling of honour and candour which daily ruins so many milliners' apprentices. He believed all to sympathize with virtue, and thought that vice was thrown in by providence merely for the picturesque effect of the scene, as we see in romances. He thought that the misery of a cottage merely consisted in the vesting of clothes, which were as warm, but which were better adapted to the painter's eye by their irregular folds and various coloured patches. He thought, in fine, that the dreams of poets were the realities of life. He was handsome, frank, and rich. For these reasons, upon his entering into the gay circles, many mothers surrounded him, striving which should describe with least truth their languishing or romping favourites. The daughters, at the same time, by their brightening countenances when he approached, and by their sparkling eyes when he opened his lips, soon led him into false notions of his talents and his merit. 
Attached as he was to the romance of his solitary hours, he was startled at finding that, except in the tallow and wax candles that flickered not from the presence of a ghost, but from want of snuffing, there was no foundation in real life for any of that congeries of pleasing pictures and descriptions contained in those volumes from which he had formed his study. Finding, however, some compensation in his gratified vanity, he was about to relinquish his dreams, when the extraordinary being we have above described crossed him in his career. He watched him, and the very impossibility of forming an idea of the character of a man entirely absorbed in himself, who gave few other signs of his observation of external objects than the tacit assent to their existence, implied by the avoidance of their contact, allowing his imagination to picture every thing that flattered its propensity to extravagant ideas, he soon formed this object into the hero of a romance, and determined to observe the offspring of his fancy rather than the person before him. He became acquainted with him, paid him attentions, and so far advanced upon his notice that his presence was always recognised. He gradually learned that Lord Ruthven's affairs were embarrassed, and soon found, from the notes of preparation in Street, that he was about to travel. Desirous of gaining some information respecting this singular character, who, till now, had only whetted his curiosity, he hinted to his guardians that it was time for him to perform the tour which, for many generations, has been thought necessary to enable the young to take some rapid steps in the career of vice towards putting themselves upon an equality with the aged, and not allowing them to appear as if fallen from the skies whenever scandalous intrigues are mentioned as the subjects of pleasantry or of praise, according to the degree of skill shown in carrying them on. They consented, and Aubrey, immediately mentioning his intentions to Lord Ruthven, was surprised to receive from him a proposal to join him. Flattered by such a mark of esteem from him, who apparently had nothing in common with other men, he gladly accepted it, and in a few days, they had passed the circling waters. Hitherto Aubrey had had no opportunity of studying Lord Ruthven's character, and now he found that though many more of his actions were exposed to his view, the results offered different conclusions from the apparent motives to his conduct. His companion was profuse in his liberality. The idle, the vagabond, and the beggar received from his hand more than enough to relieve their immediate wants. But Aubrey could not avoid remarking that it was not upon the virtuous, reduced to indigence by the misfortunes attendant even upon virtue, that he bestowed his arms. These were sent from the door with hardly suppressed sneers. But when the profligate came to ask something, not to relieve his wants, but to allow him to wallow in his lust, or to sink him still deeper in his iniquity. He was sent away with rich charity. This was, however, attributed by him to the greater importunity of the vicious, which generally prevails over the retiring bashfulness of the virtuous indigent. There was one circumstance about the charity of his lordship which was still more impressed upon his mind, all those upon whom it was bestowed inevitably found that there was a curse upon it, for they were either all led to the scaffold or sunk to the lowest and the most abject misery. At Brussels and other towns through which they passed, Aubrey was surprised at the apparent eagerness with which his companions sought for the centres of all fashionable vice. There he entered into all the spirit of the faro table, he betted, and always gambled with success, except where the known sharper was his antagonist, and then he lost even more than he gained. But it was always with the same unchanging face with which he generally watched the society around. It was not, however, so when he encountered the rash, 
youthful novice, or the luckless father of a numerous family. Then his very wish seemed fortune's law. This apparent abstractedness of mind was laid aside, and his eyes sparkled with more fire than that of the cat, whilst dallying with the half-dead mouse. In every town he left a formerly affluent youth, torn from the circle he adorned, cursing in the solitude of a dungeon the fate that had drawn him within the reach of this fiend. Whilst many a father sat frantic amidst the speaking looks of mute, hungry children, without a single farthing of his late immense wealth, wherewith to buy even sufficient to satisfy their present craving. Yet he took no money from the gambling table, but immediately lost to the ruiner of many the last gilder he had just snatched from the convulsive grasp of the innocent. This might but be the result of a certain degree of knowledge which was not, however, capable of combating the cunning of the more experienced. Aubrey often wished to represent this to his friend, and beg him to resign that charity and pleasure which proved the ruin of all, and did not tend to his own profit. But he delayed it, for each day he hoped his friend would give him some opportunity of speaking frankly and openly to him. However, this never occurred. Lord Ruthven in his carriage, and amidst the various wild and rich scenes of nature, was always the same. His eye spoke less than his lip, and though Aubrey was near the object of his curiosity, he obtained no greater gratification from it than the constant excitement of vainly wishing to break that mystery which to his exalted imagination began to assume the appearance of something supernatural. They soon arrived at Rome, and Aubrey for a time lost sight of his companion. He left him in daily attendance upon the morning circle of an Italian countess, whilst he went in search of the memorials of another almost deserted city. Whilst he was thus engaged, letters arrived from England, which he opened with eager impatience. The first was from his sister, breathing nothing but affection. The others were from his guardians. The latter astonished him. If it had been before entered into his imagination that there was an evil power resident in his companion, these seemed to give him sufficient reason for the belief. His guardians insisted upon his immediately leaving his friend, and urged that his character was dreadfully vicious, for that the possession of irresistible powers of seduction rendered his licentious habits more dangerous to society. It had been discovered that his contempt for the adulteress had not originated in hatred of her character, but that he had required to enhance his gratification that his victim, the partner of his guilt, should be hurled from the pinnacle of unsullied virtue down to the lowest abyss of infamy and degradation. In fine, that all those females whom he had sought, apparently on account of their virtue, had, since his departure, thrown even the mask aside, and had not scrupled to expose the whole deformity of their vices to the public gaze. Aubrey determined upon leaving one whose character had not yet shown a single bright point on which to rest the eye, he resolved to invent some plausible pretext for abandoning him altogether, purposing, in the meanwhile, to watch him more closely, and to let no slight circumstances pass by unnoticed. He entered into the same circle, and soon perceived that his lordship was endeavouring to work upon the inexperience of the daughter of the lady whose house he chiefly frequented. In Italy, it is seldom that an unmarried female is met with in society. He was therefore obliged to carry on his plans in secret, but Aubrey's eye followed him in all his windings, and soon discovered that an assignation had been appointed, 
which would most likely end in the ruin of an innocent, though thoughtless, girl. Losing no time, he entered the apartment of Lord Ruthven and abruptly asked him his intentions with respect to the lady, informing him at the same time that he was aware of his being about to meet her that very night. Lord Ruthven answered that his intentions were such as he supposed all would have upon such an occasion, and upon being pressed whether he intended to marry her, merely laughed. Aubrey retired, and immediately writing a note to say, From that moment he must decline accompanying his lordship in the remainder of the proposed tour. He ordered his servant to seek other apartments, and calling upon the mother of the lady informed her of all he knew, not only with regard to her daughter, but also concerning the character of his lordship. The assignation was prevented. Lord Ruthven next day merely sent his servant to notify his complete assent to a separation, but did not hint any suspicion of his plans having been foiled by Aubrey's interposition. Having left Rome, Aubrey directed his steps towards Greece, and crossing the peninsula soon found himself at Athens. He then fixed his residence in the house of a Greek, and soon occupied himself in tracing the faded records of ancient glory upon monuments that, apparently, ashamed of chronicling the deeds of free men only before slaves, had hidden themselves beneath the sheltering soil or many-coloured lichen. Under the same roof as himself existed a being so beautiful and delicate that she might have formed a model for a painter wishing to portray on canvas the promised hope of the faithful in Mohammed's paradise, save that her eyes spoke too much mind for anyone to think that she could belong to those who had no souls. As she danced upon the plain or tripped along the mountainside, one would have thought the gazelle a poor type of her beauties, for who would have exchanged her eye, apparently the eye of animated nature, for that sleepy, luxurious look of the animal suited but to the taste of an epicure? The light step of Ianthe often accompanied Aubrey in his search after antiquities, and often would the unconscious girl, engaged in the pursuit of a cashmere butterfly, show the whole beauty of her form floating, as it were, upon the wind, to the eager gaze of him, who had forgotten the letters he had just deciphered upon an almost effaced tablet, in the contemplation of her sylph-like figure. Often would her tresses falling as she flitted around exhibit in the sun's right such delicately brilliant and swiftly fading hues. It might well excuse the forgetfulness of the antiquary, who let escape from his mind the very object he had before thought of vital importance to the proper interpretation of a passage in Pausanias. But why attempt to describe charms which all feel, but none can appreciate? It was innocence, youth, and beauty, unaffected by crowded drawing-rooms and stifling balls, Whilst he drew those remains of which he wished to preserve a memorial for his future hours, she would stand by and watch the magic effects of his pencil in tracing the scenes of her native place. She would then describe to him the circling dance upon the open plain, would paint to him in all the glowing colours of youthful memory the marriage pomp she remembered viewing in her infancy, and then, turning to subjects that had evidently made a greater impression upon her mind, would tell him all the supernatural tales of her nurse. Her earnestness and apparent belief of what she narrated excited the interest even of Aubrey, and often as she told him the tale of the living vampire, who had passed years amidst his friends and dearest ties, forced every year by feeding upon the life of a lovely female to prolong his existence for the ensuing months. His blood would run cold, whilst he attempted to laugh her out of such idle and horrible fantasies. But Ianthe cited to him the names of old men who had at last detected one living among themselves, after several of their near relatives and children had been found marked with the stamp of the fiend's appetite. 
and when she found him so incredulous, she begged of him to believe her, for it had been remarked that those who had dared to question their existence always had some proof given, which obliged them with grief and heart-breaking to confess it was true. She detailed to him the traditional appearance of these monsters, and his horror was increased by hearing a pretty accurate description of Lord Ruthven. He, however, still persisted in persuading her that there could be no truth in her fears, though, at the same time, he wondered at the many coincidences which had all tended to excite a belief in the supernatural power of Lord Ruthven. Aubrey began to attach himself more and more to Ianthe, her innocence so contrasted with all the affected virtues of the women among whom he had sought for his vision of romance, won his heart, and while he ridiculed the idea of a young man of English habits marrying an uneducated Greek girl, still he found himself more and more attached to the almost fairy form before him. He would tear himself at times from her, and forming a plan for some antiquarian research he would depart, determined not to return until his object was attained. But he always found it impossible to fix his attention upon the ruins around him, whilst in his mind he retained an image that seemed alone the rightful possessor of his thoughts. Ianthe was unconscious of his love, and was ever the same frank infantile being he had first known. She always seemed to part from him with reluctance, but it was because she no longer had anyone with whom she could visit her favourite haunts, whilst her guardian was occupied in sketching or uncovering some fragment which had yet escaped the destructive hand of time. She had appealed to her parents on the subject of vampires, and they both, with several present, affirmed their existence, pale with horror at the very name. Soon after, Aubrey determined to proceed upon one of his excursions, which was to detain him for a few hours. When they heard the name of the place, they all at once begged of him not to return at night, as he must certainly pass through a wood where no Greek would ever remain, after the day had closed, upon any consideration. They described it as the resort of vampires in their nocturnal orgies, and denounced the most heavy evils as impending upon him who dared to cross their path. Aubrey made light of their representations, and tried to laugh them out of the idea. But when he saw them shudder at his daring thus to mock a superior, infernal power, the very name of which apparently made their blood freeze, he was silent. Next morning, Aubrey set off upon his excursion unattended. He was surprised to observe the melancholy face of his host, and was concerned to find that his words, mocking the belief of those horrible fiends, had inspired them with such terror. When he was about to depart, Ianthe came to the side of his horse, and earnestly begged of him to return ere night allowed the power of these beings to be put in action he promised. He was, however, so occupied in his research that he did not perceive that daylight would soon end, and that in the horizon there was one of those specks which, in the warmer climates, so rapidly gather into a tremendous mass and pour all their rage upon the devoted country. He at last, however, mounted his horse, determined to make up by speed for his delay, but it was too late. Twilight in these southern climates is almost unknown. Immediately the sun sets, night begins, and ere he had advanced far, the power of the storm was above. Its echoing thunders had scarcely an interval of rest. Its thick heavy rain forced its way through the canopying foliage, whilst the blue forked lightning seemed to fall and radiate at his very feet. Suddenly his horse took fright, and he was carried with dreadful rapidity through the entangled forest. The animal at last, through fatigue, stopped, and he found, by the glare of lightning, that he was in the neighbourhood of a hovel that hardly lifted itself up from the masses of dead leaves and brushwood which surrounded it. Dismounting, he approached, 
hoping to find someone to guide him to the town, or at least trusting to obtain shelter from the pelting of the storm. As he approached, the thunders, for a moment silent, allowed him to hear the dreadful shrieks of a woman mingling with the stifled, exultant mockery of a laugh continued in one almost unbroken sound. He was startled, but roused by the thunder which again rolled over his head, he, with sudden effort, forced open the door of the hut. He found himself in utter darkness. The sound, however, guided him. He was apparently unperceived, for though he called, still the sounds continued, and no notice was taken of him. He found himself in contact with someone whom he immediately seized when a voice cried, Again, baffled! to which a loud laugh succeeded, and he felt himself grappled by one whose strength seemed superhuman. Determined to sell his life as dearly as he could, he struggled, but it was in vain. He was lifted from his feet and hurled with enormous force against the ground. His enemy threw himself upon him, and kneeling upon his breast, had placed his hands upon his throat, when the glare of many torches penetrating through the hole that gave light in the day disturbed him. He instantly rose, and leaving his prey, rushed through the door, and in a moment the crashing of the branches as he broke through the wood was no longer heard. The storm was now still, and Aubrey, incapable of moving, was soon heard by those without. They entered, the light of their torches fell upon the mud walls, and the thatch loaded on every individual straw with heavy flakes of soot. At the desire of Aubrey they searched for her who had attracted him by their cries. He was again left in darkness. But what was his horror when the light of the torches once more burst upon him to perceive the airy form of his fair conductress brought in a lifeless course. He shut his eyes, hoping that it was but a vision arising from his disturbed imagination. But he again saw the same form when he unclosed them. Stretched by his side, there was no colour upon her cheek, not even upon her lip. Yet there was a stillness about her face that seemed almost as attaching as the life that once dwelt there. Upon her neck and breast was blood, and upon her throat were the marks of teeth having opened the vein. To this the men pointed, crying simultaneously, struck with horror, A vampire! A vampire! A litter was quickly formed, and Aubrey was laid by the side of her, who had lately been to him the object of so many bright and fairy visions, now fallen with the flower of life that had died within her. He knew not what his thoughts were, his mind was benumbed and seemed to shun reflection and take refuge in vacancy. He held almost unconsciously in his hand a naked dagger of a particular construction, which had been found in the hut. They were soon met by different parties who had been engaged in the search of her whom a mother had missed. Their lamentable cries as they approached the city forewarned the parents of some dreadful catastrophe. To describe their grief would be impossible, but when they ascertained the cause of their child's death they looked at Aubrey and pointed to the course they were inconsolable. Both died broken-hearted. Aubrey, being put to bed, was seized by a most violent fever, and was often delirious. In these intervals he would call upon Lord Ruthven and upon Ianthe by some unaccountable combination. He seemed to beg of his former companion to spare the being he loved. At other times he would imprecate maledictions upon his head and curse him as her destroyer. Lord Ruthven chanced at this time to arrive at Athens, and from whatever motive, upon hearing the state of Aubrey, immediately placed himself in the same house and became his constant attendant. When the latter recovered from his delirium, he was horrified and startled by the sight of him whose image he had now combined with that of a vampire. 
But Lord Ruthven, by his kind words, implying almost repentance for the fault that had caused their separation, and still more by the attention, anxiety, and care which he showed, soon reconciled him to his presence. His lordship seemed quite changed. He no longer appeared that apathetic being who had so astonished Aubrey, but as soon as his convalescence began to be rapid, he again gradually retired into the same state of mind, and Aubrey perceived no difference from the former man, except that at times he was surprised to meet his gaze fixed intently upon him, with a smile of malicious exultation playing upon his lips. He knew not why, but this smile haunted him. During the last stages of the invalid's recovery, Lord Ruthven was apparently engaged in watching the tideless waves raised by the cooling breeze, or in marking the progress of those orbs circling, like our world, the moveless sun. Indeed, he appeared to wish to avoid the eyes of all. Aubrey's mind by this shock was much weakened, and that elasticity of spirit which had once so distinguished him now seemed to have fled for ever. He was now as much a lover of solitude and silence as Lord Ruthven, but much as he wished for solitude, his mind could not find it in the neighbourhood of Athens. If he sought it amidst the ruins he had formerly frequented, Ianthe's form stood by his side. If he sought it in the woods, her light step would appear wandering amidst the underwood, in quest of the modest violet, and then, suddenly turning round, would show to his wild imagination her pale face and wounded throat, with a meek smile upon her lips. He determined to fly scenes every feature of which created such bitter associations in his mind. He proposed to Lord Ruthven, to whom he held himself bound by the tender care he had taken of him during his illness, that they should visit those parts of Greece neither had yet seen. They travelled in every direction, and sought every spot to which a recollection could be attached. But though they thus hastened from place to place, yet they seemed not to heed what they gazed upon. They heard much of robbers, but they gradually began to slight these reports which they imagined were only the invention of individuals whose interest it was to excite the generosity of those whom they defended from pretended dangers. In consequence of thus neglecting the advice of the inhabitants, on one occasion they travelled with only a few guards more to serve as guides than as a defence. Upon entering, however, a narrow defile, at the bottom of which was the bed of a torrent, with large masses of rock brought down from the neighbouring precipices, they had reason to repent their negligence, for scarcely were the whole of the party engaged in the narrow pass when they were startled by the whistling of bullets close to their heads and by the echoed report of several guns. In an instant their guards had left them, and placing themselves behind rocks, had begun to fire in the direction whence the report came. Lord Ruthven and Aubrey, imitating their example, retired for a moment behind the sheltering turn of the defile, but ashamed of being thus detained by a foe who, with insulting shouts, bade them advance, and being exposed to unresisting slaughter, if any of the robbers should climb above and take them in the rear, they determined at once to rush forward in search of the enemy. Hardly had they lost the shelter of the rock when Lord Ruthven received a shot in the shoulder which brought him to the ground. Aubrey hastened to his assistance, and, no longer heeding the contest or his own peril, was soon surprised by seeing the robbers' faces around him, his guards having, upon Lord Ruthven's being wounded, immediately thrown up their arms and surrendered. By promises of great reward, Aubrey soon induced them to convey his wounded friend to a neighbouring cabin, and having agreed upon a ransom, he was no more disturbed by their presence they being content merely to guard the entrance till their comrade should return with the promised sum for which he had an order. Lord Ruthven's strength rapidly decreased. In two days mortification ensued, and death seemed advancing with hasty steps. His conduct and appearance had not changed. He seemed as unconscious of pain as he had been of the objects around him, but towards the close of the last evening his mind became apparently uneasy, and his eye often fixed upon Aubrey, 
who was induced to offer his assistance with more than usual earnestness. Assist me. You may save me. You may do more than that. I mean not my life. I heed the death of my existence as little as that of the passing day. But you may save my honour, your friend's honour. How? Tell me how. I would do anything, replied Aubrey. I need but little. My life ebbs apace. I cannot explain the whole, but if you would conceal all you know of me, my honour were free from stain in the world's mouth, and if my death were unknown for some time in England, I, I, but life, it shall not be known. Swear, cried the dying man, raising himself with exultant violence, swear by all your soul reveres, by all your nature fears, swear that for a year and a day you will not impart your knowledge of my crimes or death to any living being in any way, whatever may happen, or whatever you may see. His eyes seemed bursting from their sockets. I swear, said Aubrey. He sunk, laughing upon his pillow, and breathed no more. Aubrey retired to rest, but did not sleep. The many circumstances attending his acquaintance with this man rose upon his mind, and he knew not why. When he remembered his oath, a cold shivering came over him, as if from the presentiment of something horrible awaiting him. Rising early in the morning, he was about to enter the hovel in which he had left the corpse, when a robber met him, and informed him that it was no longer there, having been conveyed by himself and comrades, upon his retiring, to the pinnacle of a neighbouring mount, according to a promise they had given his lordship, that it should be exposed to the first cold ray of the moon that rose after his death. Aubrey, astonished, and taking several of the men, determined to go and bury it upon the spot where it lay. But when he had mounted to the summit, he found no trace of either the corpse or the clothes, though the robbers swore they pointed out the identical rock on which they had laid the body. For a time his mind was bewildered in conjectures, but he at last returned, convinced that they had buried the corpse for the sake of the clothes. Weary of a country in which he had met with such terrible misfortunes, and in which all apparently conspired to heighten the superstitious melancholy that had seized upon his mind, he resolved to leave it, and soon arrived at Smyrna. While waiting for a vessel to convey him to Otranto or to Naples, he occupied himself in arranging those effects he had with him belonging to Lord Ruthven. Amongst other things, there was a case containing several weapons of offence, more or less adapted to ensure the death of the victim, there were several daggers and attagans. Whilst turning them over and examining their curious forms, what was his surprise at finding a sheath apparently ornamented in the same style as the dagger discovered in the fatal hut? He shuddered, hastening to gain further proof. He found the weapon, and his horror may be imagined when he discovered that it fitted, though peculiarly shaped, the sheath he held in his hand. His eyes seemed to need no further certainty. They seemed gazing to be bound to the dagger, and yet still he wished to disbelieve. But the particular form, the same varying tints upon the haft and sheath, were alike in splendour on both, and left no room for doubt. There were also drops of blood on each. He left Smyrna, and on his way home at Rome, his first inquiries were concerning the lady he had attempted to snatch from Lord Ruthven's seductive arts. Her parents were in distress, their fortune ruined, and she had not been heard of since the departure of his lordship. Aubrey's mind became almost broken under so many repeated horrors. He was afraid that this lady had fallen a victim to the destroyer of Ianthe. He became morose and silent, and his only occupation consisted in urging the speed of the postilions, as if he were going to save the life of someone he held dear. He arrived at Calais, a breeze which seemed obedient to his will, soon wafted him to the English shores, and he hastened to the mansion of his father's, and there for a moment appeared to lose in the embraces and caresses of his sister all memory of the past. 
If she before by her infantine caresses had gained his affection, now that the woman began to appear, she was still more attaching as a companion. Miss Aubrey had not that winning grace which gains the gaze and applause of the drawing-room assemblies. There was none of that light brilliancy which only exists in the heated atmosphere of a crowded apartment. Her blue eye was never lit up by the levity of the mind beneath. There was a melancholy charm about it which did not seem to arise from misfortune, but from some feeling within that appeared to indicate a soul conscious of a brighter realm. Her step was not that light footing which strays where'er a butterfly or a colour may attract. It was sedate and pensive. When alone, her face was never brightened by the smile of joy, but when her brother breathed to her his affection, and would in her presence forget those griefs she knew destroyed his rest, who would have exchanged her smile for that of the voluptuary? It seemed as if those eyes, that face, were then playing in the light of their own native sphere. She was yet only eighteen, and had not been presented to the world, it having been thought by her guardians more fit that her presentation should be delayed until her brother's return from the continent, when he might be her protector. It was now, therefore, resolved that the next drawing-room, which was fast approaching, should be the epoch of her entry into the busy scene. Aubrey would rather have remained in the mansion of his father's, and feed upon the melancholy which overpowered him. He could not feel interest about the frivolities of fashionable strangers, when his mind had been so torn by the events he had witnessed. But he determined to sacrifice his own comfort to the protection of his sister. They soon arrived in town and prepared for the next day, which had been announced as a drawing-room. The crowd was excessive. A drawing-room had not been held for a long time, and all who were anxious to bask in the smile of royalty hastened thither. Aubrey was there with his sister. While he was standing in a corner by himself, heedless of all around him, engaged in the remembrance that the first time he had seen Lord Ruthven was in that very place, he felt himself suddenly seized by the arm, and a voice he recognised too well sounded in his ear. Remember your oath. He had hardly courage to turn, fearful of seeing a spectre that would blast him, when he perceived, at a little distance, the same figure which had attracted his notice on this spot, on his first entry into society. He gazed till his limbs almost refusing to bear their weight, he was obliged to take the arm of a friend, and forcing a passage through the crowd, he threw himself into his carriage and was driven home. He paced the room with hurried steps, and fixed his hands upon his head, as if he were afraid his thoughts were bursting from his brain. Lord Ruthven, again before him. Circumstances started up in dreadful array. The dagger. His oath. He roused himself. He could not believe it possible. The dead rise again? He thought his imagination had conjured up the image his mind was resting upon. It was impossible that it could be real. He determined, therefore, to go again into society, for though he attempted to ask concerning Lord Ruthven, the name hung upon his lips, and he could not succeed in gaining information. He went a few nights after this with his sister to the assembly of a near relation. Leaving her under the protection of a matron, he retired into a recess, and there gave himself up to his own devouring thoughts. Perceiving at last that many were leaving, he roused himself, and entering another room, found his sister surrounded by several, apparently in earnest conversation. He attempted to pass and get near her, when one, whom he requested to move, turned round, and revealed to him those features he most abhorred. He sprang forward, seized his sister's arm, and with hurried step forced her towards the street. At the door he found himself impeded by the crowd of servants who were waiting for their lords, and while he was engaged in passing them, he again heard that voice whisper close to him, Remember your oath! He did not dare to turn, but hurrying his sister soon reached home.
Aubrey became almost distracted. If before his mind had been absorbed by one subject, how much more completely was it engrossed, now that the certainty of the monsters living again pressed upon his thoughts? His sister's attentions were now unheeded, and it was in vain that she entreated him to explain to her what had caused his abrupt conduct. He only uttered a few words, and those terrified her. The more he thought, the more he was bewildered. His oath startled him. Was he then to allow this monster to roam, bearing ruin upon his breath, amidst all he held dear, and not avert its progress? His very sister might have been touched by him, but even if he were to break his oath and disclose his suspicions, who would believe him? He thought of employing his own hand to free the world from such a wretch, but death, he remembered, had already been mocked. For days he remained in this state, shut up in his room. He saw no one, and ate only when his sister came, who, with eyes streaming with tears, besought him for her sake to support nature. At last, no longer capable of bearing stillness and solitude, he left his house, roamed from street to street, anxious to fly that image which haunted him. His dress became neglected, and he wandered, as often exposed to the noonday sun as to the midnight damps. He was no longer to be recognized, at first he returned with the evening to the house, but at last he laid him down to rest wherever fatigue overtook him. His sister, anxious for his safety, implored people to follow him, but they were soon distanced by him who fled from a pursuer swifter than any, from thought. His conduct, however, suddenly changed. Struck with the idea that he had left by his absence the whole of his friends with a fiend amongst them, of whose presence they were unconscious, he determined to enter again into society and watch him closely, anxious to forewarn, in spite of his oath, all whom Lord Ruthven approached with intimacy. But when he entered into a room, his haggard and suspicious looks were so striking, his inward shuddering so visible, that his sister was at last obliged to beg of him to abstain from seeking, for her sake, a society which affected him so strongly. When, however, remonstrance proved unavailing, the guardians thought proper to interpose, and fearing that his mind was becoming alienated, they thought it high time to resume again that trust which had been before imposed upon them by Aubrey's parents. Desirous of saving him from the injuries and sufferings he had daily encountered in his wanderings, and of preventing him from exposing to the general eye those marks of what they considered folly, they engaged a physician to reside in the house and take constant care of him. He hardly appeared to notice it, so completely was his mind absorbed by one terrible subject. His incoherence became at last so great that he was confined to his chamber, there he would often lie for days, incapable of being roused. He had become emaciated, his eyes had attained a glassy luster. The only sign of affection and recollection remaining displayed itself upon the entry of his sister. Then he would sometimes start, and seizing her hands with looks that severely afflicted her, he would desire her not to touch him. Oh, do not touch him! If your love for me is aught, do not go near him! When, however, she inquired to whom he referred, his only answer was, True, true, and again he sank into a state whence not even she could rouse him. This lasted many months. Gradually, however, as the year was passing, his incoherence became less frequent, and his mind threw off a portion of its gloom, whilst his guardians observed that several times in the day he would count upon his fingers a definite number, and then smile. The time had nearly elapsed when, upon the last day of the year, one of his guardians entering the room began to converse with his physician upon the melancholy circumstance of Aubrey's being in so awful a situation, when his sister was going next day to be married. Instantly Aubrey's attention was attracted. He asked anxiously to whom. Glad of this mark of returning intellect of which they feared he had been deprived, they mentioned the name of the Earl of Marsden. Thinking this was a young earl whom he had met with in society, Aubrey seemed pleased, 
and astonished them still more by his expressing his intention to be present at the nuptials, and desiring to see his sister, they answered not. But in a few minutes his sister was with him. He was apparently again capable of being affected by the influence of her lovely smile, for he pressed her to his breast and kissed her cheek, wet with tears, flowing at the thought of her brother's being once more alive to the feelings of affection. He began to speak with all his wonted warmth, and to congratulate her upon a marriage with a person so distinguished for rank and every accomplishment, when he suddenly perceived a locket upon her breast. Opening it, what was his surprise at beholding the features of the monster who had so long influenced his life? He seized the portrait in a paroxysm of rage and trampled it underfoot. Upon her asking him why he thus destroyed the resemblance of her future husband, he looked as if he did not understand her. Then, seizing her hands and gazing on her with frantic expression of countenance, he bade her swear that she would never wed this monster, for he... But he could not advance. It seemed as if that voice again bade him remember his oath. He turned suddenly round, thinking Lord Ruthven was near him, but saw no one. In the meantime, the guardians and physician who had heard the whole and thought this was but a return of his disorder, entered, and forcing him from Miss Aubrey, desired her to leave him. He fell upon his knees to them, he implored, he begged of them to delay but for one day, they attributing this to the insanity they imagined had taken possession of his mind, endeavoured to pacify him, and retired. Lord Ruthven had called the morning after the drawing-room, and had been refused with everyone else, when he heard of Aubrey's ill health, he readily understood himself to be the cause of it, but when he learned that he was deemed insane, his exultation and pleasure could hardly be concealed from those among whom he had gained this information. He hastened to the house of his former companion, and by constant attendance, and by the pretense of great affection for the brother and interest in his fate, he gradually won the ear of Miss Aubrey. Who could resist his power? His tongue had dangers and toils to recount, could speak of himself as of an individual having no sympathy with any being on the crowded earth, save with her to whom he addressed himself, could tell how, since he knew her, his existence had begun to seem worthy of preservation, if it were merely that he might listen to her soothing accents. In fine, he knew so well how to use the serpent's art, or such was the will of fate that he gained her affections. The title of the elder branch falling at length to him, he obtained an important embassy, which served as an excuse for hastening the marriage, in spite of her brother's deranged state, which was to take place the very day before his departure for the continent. Aubrey, when he was left by the physician and his guardians, attempted to bribe the servants, but in vain. He asked for pen and paper, it was given him, he wrote a letter to his sister, conjuring her as she valued her own happiness, her own honour, and the honour of those now in the grave who once held her in their arms as their hope and the hope of their house, to delay but for a few hours that marriage on which he denounced the most heavy curses. The servants promised they would deliver it, but giving it to the physician, he thought it better not to harass any more the mind of Miss Aubrey by what he considered the ravings of a maniac. Night passed on without rest to the busy inmates of the house, and Aubrey heard, with a horror that may more easily be conceived than described, the notes of busy preparation. Morning came, and the sound of carriages broke upon his ear. Aubrey grew almost frantic, the curiosity of the servants at last overcame their vigilance. They gradually stole away, leaving him in the custody of a helpless old woman. He seized the opportunity, with one bound was out of the room, and in a moment found himself in the apartment where all were nearly assembled. Lord Ruthven was the first to perceive him. He immediately approached, and taking his arm by force, hurried him from the room, speechless with rage. When on the staircase, Lord Ruthven whispered in his ear, 
Remember your oath, and know, if not my bride today, your sister is dishonoured. Women are frail. So saying, he pushed him towards his attendants, who, roused by the old woman, had come in search of him. Aubrey could no longer support himself. His rage, not finding vent, had broken a blood vessel, and he was conveyed to bed. This was not mentioned to his sister, who was not present when he entered, as the physician was afraid of agitating her. The marriage was solemnized, and the bride and bridegroom left London. Aubrey's weakness increased. The effusion of blood produced symptoms of the near approach of death. He desired his sister's guardians might be called, and when the midnight hour had struck, he related composedly what the reader has perused. He died immediately after. The guardians hastened to protect Miss Aubrey, but when they arrived... It was too late. Lord Ruthven had disappeared, and Aubrey's sister had glutted the thirst of a vampire. You might be one of those people like me who doesn't like the stories to be interrupted with ads and this podcast has ads on it. However, there is a solution. If you would like access to the stories without ads and a link to a library of all the stories I've ever done that you can download without ads, you can get that by becoming a patron. So if you join for $5 or the equivalent in your currency a month, you can have all the stories ad-free. So consider becoming a patron go to www.patreon.com forward slash barkid, B-A-R-C-U-D. So that was The Vampire by Dr. John Polidori, um, published in 1819, first of all, and considered the first vampire story, although there had been references to vampires in European literature before that, but this was the first kind of, it's not a novel, it's too short, it's a short story really. Anyway, let me say something about John William Polidori, an Italian-English physician and writer born in 1795. He was a notable figure associated with the Romantic movement. As the elder son of Gaetano Polidori, an Italian scholar, and Anna Maria Pierce, a governess, Polidori was exposed to intellectual pursuits from a young age. He received his medical degree from the University of Edinburgh in 1815 at the remarkably young age of 19. Uh, so I think he's only four years older when um, The Vampire is produced, published. Um, Polidori's literary talents and connections led him to serve as personal physician to the renowned eccentric poet Lord Byron, embarking on a European tour with him in 1816. During their travels, Polidori found himself in the company of other literary luminaries including Mary Shelley and Percy Bysshe Shelley, the poet, and Mary, of course, is the writer of Frankenstein. It was during this time at the Villa Diodati by Lake Geneva that the idea for the vampire took, took shape, inspired by a fragment of a story by Lord Byron. Well, apparently the story goes, it was, it was a very bad winter, and something to do, I was looking at this, there was a, an, an a, a eruption of a, um, a volcano in Iceland that cast volcanic ash into the sky and made the, that winter, that summer, very dismal in Europe, cold and wet. So, um, at the Villa Diodati, there's Lord Byron, there's John Polidori, uh, Mary Bish Shelley, Mary Shelley, Wollenscraft, uh, the writer of Frankenstein, I've already said, and Percy Bish, the uh, famous romantic poet. They're all sitting there, and they uh, were reading a German uh, book of macabre stories, called the Phantasmagoria, I think. Not Phantasmagoria, Phantasmanagoria, I think it was. And this, uh, apparently, um, at some point, Shelley rushes out the room, and they go out to find him, and he's kind of crying by the window, and he's been so uh, overwhelmed by the grotesque stories 
Anyway, that doesn't put them off and they decide they're each going to write a story. And Byron did a bit, but never finished. It was just a fragment. Polidori wrote The Vampire and Mary went off and wrote Frankenstein, in my opinion. They both published Frankenstein, published 1819. Um, the Vampire, published in 1819. Um, Frankenstein, by far the better story, by far. Anyway, let's go on. So they're, they're having this party and it turns out they're all going to write this. So later on, in April 1819, in a new monthly magazine, The Vampire was published, but falsely attributed to Lord Byron. Now, Mary Shelley, in her introduction to um, Frankenstein, alludes to this famous poet, by, uh, who she doesn't mention, it's clearly Byron, and says the story would probably be better received if it was in his name, but it wasn't. And obviously, Polidori has the same idea, or his publisher, and this misattribution persisted for years, confusing confusion over the true authorship of the story. It is said that Polidori's uh, Lord Ruthven, you can say it different ways, but apparently uh, on the internet, in Glasgow they call they say Ruthven, so they don't say Ruthven like me, they say Ruthven, Ruthven, uh, rolling their eyes very heroically. Um, and so, but... So what is, so remember, let's talk about the poetry that existed before. This is the first vampire story, but what existed before? So what we have is um, Byron's own 1813, the Giaur, I don't know how to say that, the Giaur, it's not a word we use around here. And, and then in 1810, there was the Vampire by John Stagg and Der Vampir in 1748 by Heinrich August Ossenfelter. So, uh, you know, there were poems about vampires, but Polidori's was the first. And if Byron was a famous womanizer. I mean, if you read, there's a lot of stuff said about Byron. Um, people either loved him or they hated him, you know. But certainly his life was beset by scandals. Uh, lots of uh, sexual escapades, liaisons with both men and women, allegations of cruelty and immorality and speculations about his involvement in other scandals of the time. Uh, even accusations of a relationship with his half-sister, Augusta Lee. Uh, he had a very flamboyant lifestyle. He was a bit of a recluse at one point, and he went and lived on the island of Mytilene for a while and would sail around the islands in his felucca. Um, in one of the books I was reading, there was a little uh, reference to some British sea captains who'd gone there looking for him. They didn't know. They hadn't, of course, Child Harold was his big success, and uh, they didn't know about him because they'd been at sea for many years away from England. And... Uh, it turned out that this guy, Byron, was locally thought to be very generous. He'd, he'd bought a, a, a boat for a, a Greek fisherman who'd lost his boat. He used to give uh, New Testaments in Greek to the locals. Um, he paid people very generously. Um, he was well thought of, you know. So uh, there we are. A, a Marmite figure, as they say, you either love him or you hate him. I was going to compare him to certain political figures these days, and I thought, you know what, Tony, it ain't worth it, the amount of um, uh, problems that will cause you. So we won't do that. We won't do that. Um, but either way, you know, some people think he was great. Some people think he was not. The, the character of Ruthven in the story is not very flattering at all, is it? It's also pretty one-dimensional. We don't learn much about Ruthven. So if we come to look at the story itself, the best bits are the more dramatised bits of, of Aubrey's madness towards the end. And that's because we have some, for the first time, reported speech. Uh, that is, for me, the most alive part of it. I thought the ending these days, you wouldn't, they wouldn't like that ending. Your publisher wouldn't want that ending at all. It would have to resolve in some way. But... Um, uh, the, the story also, so it has failings, but remember this is early days in the history of um, fiction writing. So, you know, fair play to, to John Polidori, really. Um, he introduces, I mean, so yeah, just the Byron thing, this seductive, immoral um, nobleman, is that Lord Byron? Well, P Polidori should know because he spent a lot of time with him, and it's very interesting that he appears to be the Aubrey character, doesn't he, in some ways. I'm not saying, you know, he he um, he had a tragic life. He actually um, is uh, thought to have killed himself, you know, in the end. Apparently, um, Lady Caroline Lamb had written a novel called Glenarvan, and she had a character called Lord Ruthven based on Byron. So 
those reading it in the know might have realised that he was talking about uh, Byron. Turns out that on the tour, Byron dismissed Polidori. And after that, Polidori travelled to Italy, of course, where his dad was from, and then returned to England. Uh, and we know that uh, the Vampire was published in the April 1819 edition of the new monthly magazine, without his permission, apparently. Um, I, yeah, so I don't know the details of that, honestly. Uh, whilst in London, he lived and died in Great Pulteney Street in Soho, um, much to his, well, they say his chagrin. Apparently, Byron had said when they said, did you write the vampire? He said, I desire the rights to nobody's dullness other than my own. Uh, he later wrote um, a poem, Polidori wrote a, poem, a, a, a theological poem called The Fall of Angels, published anonymously in 1821. He died in August 1821, still a very young man, weighing down by depression and gambling debts, despite the strong evidence that he committed suicide by means of prussic acid. The coroner gave a verdict of death by um, natural causes. His sister, Francis Polidori, married exiled Italian scholar Gabriele Rossetti, and so John is the uncle of Maria Francesco Rossetti, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, William Michael Rossetti, and Christina Rossetti. Christina Rossetti, all those poems. Dante Gabriel, of course, the pre-Raphaelite dude. His sister Charlotte made a transcription of his diaries but censored peccant passages and destroyed the original, so we'll never know. Um, his, uh, the diary of John Polidori was published in 1911. So he had the dirt on Lord Byron, but um, Byron had the uh, advantage over him. So what I said, I was kind of talking about the structure of the story. It's a lot of it's uh, exposition to begin with. It would have been much better if it was dramatised. It would have been much more lively and grabbed your attention more. But that isn't, they hadn't learned to do that then, you know. And uh, the, the best bit, I think, I quite like the, um, the dramatic scene where he finds Ianthe dead, murdered by this monstrous um, Lord Ruthven in the wood. Uh, and then, I mean, I say I like it, don't get me wrong. I think it, that was quite gripping. And then towards the end, as I said, his madness when he's when he finds out, you know, this um, Earl of Marsden, whatever whatever his name was, is in fact Lord Ruthven. Uh, what's interesting is there are certain features like a year and a, a day. He's bound by the oath for a year and a day. That is very much reminiscent of um, fairy and folk tales. That is the bargain. It's always a year and a day. And the other thing to remember about this, until this, the vampire is a horrid, blood sucking, undead monster that lives. It's corrupt. It's filthy, it stinks, it's not an aristocratic lord. So the whole idea of the vampire being cool and sexy that goes from through Dracula, you know, at the um, end of the, of the 19th century, nearly, not quite 100, but 70 odd years later, uh, and then sort of the Twilight series, um, where you have the Edward, the sexy vampire, and, all, and even Anne Rice's sexy vampires, you know, um, th this is Polidori. This is owes it to Polidori. So that's a really important thing that uh, he introduced. That which we've never that, that actually caught the imagination. The eighteen twenties in in uh, the Western world, the English speaking world, there was an absolute explosion of stories and um, plays and everything. There was even an uh, unauthor unauthorized um, sequel to the Vampire, produced in French. Um, and of course, then we have. Uh, Varney the Vampire of the um, the Penny Dreadfuls. So the Penny Dreadfuls were the mid-century, very cheap, very low-quality stories produced for the newly literate working class. And uh, they would just plagiarise the writers. They had to produce tons of material. I've got a copy of Varney the Vampire. It's 700 pages long. Uh, and the, and the, um, the plot is loses itself along the way because it was like a modern soap opera. I remember... Uh, dynasty dynasty how they would uh, you know it turned out it was all a dream people died but it was all a dream it was that kind of nonsense you know they had to in 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 Varney the vampire and the penny dreadfuls and polidori appears in that it, and the story's plagiarized so i think the great but there was something about that sexy seductive aristocrat tagged on to the monster the va vampire itself i don't think without polidori would have caught on it was just another ghoul type thing you know it would have been the um, preserve of people who love that kind of horror, gravy, undead, smelly, horrible things, smelly, don't wash, ugh. 
you know, whereas uh, the, the vampire after that became a sexy dude. The thing about the other things that don't appear, he's revived from his death so he can be killed, but he is revived by the moon. Vani the vampire is exactly the same, so of course, um, that, ne that never picked up, really. Um, that one, Vani has it, 1845. Polidori has it, 1819. But it, the, the Revived by Moonlight doesn't really pick up. Of course, the moon is always associated with Hecate and black magic and all of those things. I think, you're wrongly, I think, you know, the poor old moon. Uh, but um, opposite to the sun, of course. But, oh yeah, that's obvious, isn't it? Um, but, um, so yes, that's it. He's, he's basically alive. He's not frightened of sunlight. That actually uh, only comes in in Nosferatu, in the black and white uh, Murnau film, German expressionist film from the 1920s, that he can't live in sunlight. We think that's obvious now. If you ever have a vampire, well, what was I watching? Oh, I was, doing, I was playing at Baldur's Gate, the D&D uh, uh, &D video game, and um, a starring in that as a vampire. And all the vampires burn in the sunlight, not him. I'm not going to spoil the game for you, but all the spawn burn in the sunlight. And it's right through, isn't it? They all burn in the sunlight, but that, that didn't come in with Polidori. That was um, Nosferatu from the 1920s. The idea that you need an invitation to come into a house is Bram Stoker. The idea that it doesn't cast, the vampire doesn't cast a reflection, I think is also Bram Stoker. Somebody may point me out. So th this one, Lord Ruthven, doesn't have those things. He is physical, he can die. He's not frightened of sunshine. Uh, he doesn't need to be invited. He doesn't need, uh, he, do, he leaves, um, it's not said that he leaves a reflection, but it's not said that he doesn't either. So I think we, we presume he does. So this is the story of the vampire. But I think Polidori's key gift to the world, if you like, or gift to lots of people making a lot of money. Stoker, Bram Stoker didn't make a lot of money out of vampire. People have made a ton of money afterwards. But he didn't, um, uh, for copyright reasons, I think, or, you know, it deals with these publisher. I say copyright, but contract reasons is what I mean. So there we go. So, you know, forgive it. It's a very early story, 1819. We've done early stuff like this before. It is an acquired taste, I think. But um, if you want to understand Gothic literature and vampire literature, um, it's a must, must read or must listen to. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I. I'm not going to say how naughty the dogs have been today, but uh, they have been. So um, we'll leave that for another time. Okay, hope you're all well. Spread the word. Tell your friends. And if you want ad-free, I think I say that at some point, you want ad-free stories, um, you can become a patron. And if you become a patron, I've got a link to my Google Drive, and I have all the stories with no ads, and you can download them, and you can do what you want with them. You can listen to them, you can copy them whatever. So consider becoming a patron uh, and uh, you can then listen to all the stories ad free at your leisure many times if you wanted to.
Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come dies, back. Don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Come back.